Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the correct views. Sam I B. DeGange, uh, political commentary and facts here with the media speaks. Low def here, high def up there. If you're not listening live, uh, hello live viewers. If you're not listening live, you may want to think about going to the uh, high def, uh, youtube.com slash the correct views. Friends, April 15th, it's April 16th now, it's 4 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. But you get the point. April 15th, pay your taxes. Zero Hedge had an article that I wanted to get to regarding said taxes. Uh, this was more than a little interesting. It says, do you know where your tax dollar went? You go to work, you make the money, right? Where, where'd, where'd your hard-earned money go? Well, here you go. Says this will make every American feel much better about handing over that check today, as Simon Blank notes. Black notes. I believe we have an obligation to starve the beast. Um, out of each dollar, 27 cents went to the military. Almost 26.5 went to Medicare and health. Interest on the federal debt was 15.3. Social Security was 8.4. Think about it. Eight point four cents on the dollar is not going to meet the obligations we have on Social Security. In other words, the money you paid in, uh, like a, um, oh Harry Brown had said, uh, is long gone. Veterans benefits five point eight. How very kind of them. Government three point four. Food and agriculture five. Education two point five. And then again, to bring in Common Core, which makes everything worse. The rest was split up between transportation, energy, and the environment. International Affairs, Science, and Housing and Community. Um, you might be interested to know that only 1.5 cents went to International Affairs. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. As Sovereign Man Simon Black notes with a link, it is not always this way, and doesn't have to be anymore. On August 5, 1861, facing rapidly deteriorating economic conditions and a horrible defeat at Bull Run, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Revenue Act in 1861 into law. It was the first time in U.S. history that the federal government would charge an income tax on its citizens. But Lincoln felt that it was vital to fund what would become one of the most unconscionably costly conflicts in American history. And I remember, Lincoln was no great humanitarian. He... he... he he wasn't, he wasn't in favor of freeing the slaves. He only freed the slaves because it was expedient to his bigger cause, which was stopping the South from seceding. I'm not saying I'm in favor of slavery of any kind, but I'm saying that every state has a right to secede. Lincoln was not the great president that so many people say that he was. It says the original law in 1861 set a flat tax rate of 3% on incomes above $800. How much is that today? Using gold as a benchmark, it means uh, it's about 42.26 ounces, or roughly $50,500 in today's dollars. Now, do you understand? You didn't used to have to pay income tax unless you made the equivalent of $50,000 a year. 5500 5, to be exact. It's the same slippery slope that um, uh, the um, Patriot Act has been. Oh, it's going to be temporary, remember? It says the income tax was tweaked occasionally throughout the war, and it lasted for a few years afterwards to help fund Reconstruction. But it was ultimately lifted in 1873 during the administration of Ulysses S. Grant, you could argue a better president. Aside from a single episode in 1894, there would be no income tax in the United States for nearly 40 years. So, you know, of course, during that 40-year time span, we, uh, we starve to death, right? No. It says, ironically, during this 40-year period, the United States emerged as the largest and most powerful economy in the world. We did better off without the income tax says they achieved this with no income tax, no inflation, and very little public debt. Today it's entirely different. The dollar has lost 99% of its value. Isn't it interesting that uh, gold, $800, was the equivalent to $55,500? 
but yet the dollar has lost 99% of its value. That's how bad the income tax is, friends. It has destroyed the value of the dollar. The dollar is the only thing to have gone down, and it lost almost everything that it once had. It says U.S. debt is more than has ever been accumulated by any other nation in the history of the world. We've outdone Rome. Entitlement program costs are soaring, and the U.S. government's own figures estimate that the long-term funding gap for Social Security and Medicare, which I just told you about, was $40 trillion. Well, that's because what? They're taking up, what was it I say, 5.3 cents? Hey, oh, I'm sorry, 8.4 cents. Yeah, that's going to work. It says, what's even more concerning is the complete lack of care and attention that this issue receives. Politicians, of course, continue to spend money as if it was their right. But it said it's very simple calculus. When the U.S. government goes into debt, you are the collateral. You're the taxpayer. You're listening to this. <coughs> it says whether you <coughs> excuse me, realize it or not, whether you signed up for this obligation or not, you're on the hook. You're the guarantor. It's obscene when you think about it. These people have carte blanche to ruin the country, and then they stick you with the bell. Remember, this is you're standing in line at the post office for the uh, 1040 form. Continuing to pay taxes into the system only encourages them. Yeah, there's an election coming up in the land of the free, it says, but what is tremendously impactful is how your vote, how you can vote with your dollars. Every day you are making an election. By choosing one brand over another brand in the supermarket, or by buying an iPhone versus an Android, you are essentially voting for the better candidate. Over time, it says the good candidates who have history of providing quality products and services rise to the top. The bad candidates are starved of the resources that need to go on. It goes on that it's in time, it's <clears throat> to starve these people out of resources that they need. Continuing to pay taxes every year only encourages them. It sends a signal that we need to support their decisions. Cutting off their resources is a far more effective strategy. So is he saying that you should not pay your taxes and go to jail? No. Listen. He says, I'm not suggesting, as a matter of fact, that anyone commit a tax evasion or stop filing a tax return. This is a one-way ticket to the jailhouse. But I personally feel a moral obligation to arrange my affairs in a way which maximizes every deduction possible and to pay the absolute minimum that's required by law. There are countless options, from using tax-deferred options like IRAs or foreign corporations to even moving abroad. U.S. tax code, for example, provides a clear path for Americans to move overseas and pay no tax on the first $100,800 in foreign income that they earn. Did you know that? No, neither did I. It says you can move to Puerto Rico and pay absolutely nothing on investment income or corporate dividends, and most people don't realize how many options there are at their disposal to cut what they owe. With that in mind, it only makes the obvious financial sense, but it's one of the best weapons that anyone can use to fight back. I also found out when I went to the Bahamas that it doesn't cost any more to live in the Bahamas than it does here. Rent's about comparable. But do you know they don't have an income tax? That's why Chuck Norris and Michael Jordan and everybody else has these homes down there. Friends, uh, Michael Krieger, Liberty Blitzkrieg, new report finds... $153 billion in corporate welfare. Majority of taxpayer-funded public assistance goes to people who are employed. Don't zone out. What does that mean? Let me explain this to you real quick. You take Walmart. Good old Wally World. Who's doing weird things with their store closings and plumbing. Look it up. Um, they, let's say they pay $9 an hour. Well, $9 an hour isn't going to be enough to live on. So what happens is that the people making $9 an hour, who are working every day, working hard every day, they are eligible for welfare because Walmart pays so little. Then you and I are paying for their food or their whatever because they're not making enough. Then the people take the card and go back to Walmart and spend the money. So not only does Walmart put the taxpayer on the hook, but they get paid for doing it. 
That's what corporate welfare means in this instance, friends. It says, over the past few weeks, I've focused on many dangerous myths people are encouraged to tell themselves by the various power structures. These myths prevent critical thinking and make people far more malleable and passive. I've discussed, writes Michael Krieger, the stock market myth and the Hillary Clinton myth as a link for both in the articles in some detail, but today I want to expound upon the private welfare, i.e. food stamp myth. This myth has two components to it, which work brilliantly to manipulate two different segments of the U.S. population. On one hand, the wealthy and upper middle class, oh Buffy, do not need public assistance, have generally bought into one of two notions about food stamps. One that their tax dollars are actually helping the poor and that they are happy to pay their fair share of it, or two, that those on public assistance are intellectually and professionally inferior to themselves and that these people are just lazy deadbeats who should get off the couch. So which one is right? Listen to this. Interestingly, neither of these perspectives are accurate. It says they serve the corporate state perfectly, however. The reason is that by dividing the affluent classes into the false memes, they never actually see the issue for what it really is. At the same time, public assistance is actually padding corporate margins at the expense of society. That'd be you and I. Since I've discussed this a couple of years ago in the past, it's McDonald's math. You can't survive working for us. And there's some excerpts in it. Let me just say real quick, <clears throat> the uh, divide and conquer it's a very useful strategy. It's how they keep the blacks and whites mad at each other. It's how they keep the rich and poor mad at each other. When the facts prove the opposite, especially in this instance of food stamps. Um, when I was younger, my wife at the time had Crohn's disease. And she was eligible for uh, food stamps and that because she wasn't able to work. I was driving taxi for a bastard named Fred Nero at Yellow Cab, the cheapest man that ever lived. And there wasn't enough money coming in no matter how much I worked. And uh, my wife was actually the one who was on it. But I can tell you just from knowing people, and I'm, I'm on no assistance at all now, thank God. I could tell you from knowing people that this is the norm. It's not normally people just sitting home playing video games. It says, the key point I want to hammer into people is that food stamps are corporate welfare. That is uh, free money for the rich. They actually are not welfare for the workers themselves, that would be the poor, who undoubtedly don't have wonderful lives. What ends up happening is that because the government comes in and supplements egregiously low wages with benefits like food stamps, the companies don't have to pay a living wage. They can keep more of the money for themselves. So in effect, your tax money is being used to support corporate margins, that is corporate riches. Even better, many of these folks who get the food stamp benefits then turn around and spend them at the very companies which refuse to pay them decent wages to begin with. So who benefits? The CEOs and the shareholders who loses society. So don't give me this BS that the, the bottom line with the shareholders is where your obligation is. That is not true if you are bringing down the betterment of all of society by paying such poor wages that people have to rely on the government to eat. Guess what would happen if these companies failed to pay high enough wages and food stamps didn't exist? There would be massive employee organizing and ultimately the companies would have to change tack. This of course doesn't happen when the taxpayer makes up the difference and that is exactly what they want to happen. So people that want to get rid of food stamps are not people that are insensitive. They are people that know that this will change the structure of corporate America and prevent them from stealing money from the taxpayer in the way that I just laid out to you. It says, so as discussed, public assistance is actually padding corporate profits. Just look at the stock market while doing very little to improve the lives of tens of millions of people who receive them. And it talks about a woman named Nicole Beth Wallenbrock it has a PhD in French literature and uh, she can only get a part-time teaching job with a PhD no less at the city of university in New York and her wages hardly cover the uh, cost of living for her and her son and she's been on food stamps for six months she works really hard and listen to what she says here she says it's depressing and it makes her feel like a feel like a failure well think about this for a second 
a person that says is highly educated, a doctorate, I would say so, and made to feel this way about themselves is less likely to become politically active because they spend so much of their energy feeling utterly worthless. Not only that, but is someone trapped in this despondent negative psychological state ever going to rebel against the state? The hand that embarrassingly in their mind helps to feed them. No, this person is going to be politically and emotionally damaged and isolated, and that's exactly how the power structure likes it. It had the opposite effect on me. Uh, I knew that greatness was being cheated. I knew that I was being cheated, and other people that really had their act together were getting cheated. There were no opportunities, and I wanted to know why, and found out why, and I made a show out of it. But I guess that's not the way everyone thinks. It says, this is why it's so important to destroy this myth and uh, make people like Mrs. Wallenbrock understand that it is not them that is the failure. Rather, her dependence is a deliberate weapon utilized against her by a failed system. She needs to stop feeling bad about herself, rediscover her pride, and then fight back against the forces intentionally doing this to her. Until this myth is busted forever, nothing will change. That is a remarkable article. I was very, very uh, happy to see that, and I wanted to make sure I shared it with all of you. Friends, I'm going to go to a little bit of a police spying update here, if I may. And I think a lot of you, judging by my hit counts, are interested in these when I do them. Uh, this one's a little bit different than you would expect, because this one deals with uh, not just the invasion of privacy that we did with the stingrays. It's a little bit different here. This is them getting in your car, spying on you, doing whatever they can do to get money. Be How many of you ever had telemarketing jobs? I used to do that. You want to talk about starvation, greed, and evil people, be a telemarketer. Um, police paychecks depend on how many tickets they write. And this is according to a leaked document. This is Cassandra Fairbanks, the Free Thought Project. While police and their supporters continue to insist that police are out there keeping our streets safe, an international document sent from Edmondson Mayor John Galtney implies otherwise. The letter, which was included with the paychecks of the town's police officers, spells out in very plain terms their actual role in the community, extorting money for the state. That means stealing money from you. In the document obtained by Think Progress, the mayor is careful to point out that the town does not have quotas. He states that he only wants good tickets written, but adds that he is still very disappointed that the department has been extorting fewer people. Guantney goes on to threaten the officer's bank account, stating the tickets that you write do add to the revenue which the PD budget is established and will directly affect adjustments at budget time. In other words, if you don't write tickets to people that don't deserve them and lie and say they're good tickets, you're not going to get a raise. Says he doesn't stop with their pay either. The mayor then goes on to imply that the officer's benefits may be in danger should they not get their ticket production up by budget time. It has always been the desire of myself and the board to provide a safe and pleasant workplace place with good compensation and benefits for everyone. However, our ability to continue doing this is being compromised by your work slowdown. In other words, because you've been honest, or at least more honest, you're going you're gonna to lose your benefits. So write tickets to people that don't deserve them. It says, I realize that your work production records are directly affected by extenuating circumstances, and those, like such as somebody being innocent, and those factors are always accounted for as your work records are reviewed by myself and human resources, the mayor warns. In other words, the mayor is setting up a quota without formally setting up a quota, but you can tell from the dishonesty that's written in it, the entire letter is here, you can tell from the dishonesty in it exactly what this piece of filth is actually saying. And this, if you think it's something that could only happen in this one police station, then you're crazy. It's, it's very obvious that this is going on in many places. And if you don't believe me, then we'll go to this. Make arrests, issue tickets, or get fired. Missouri police caught in disgusting quota scheme. Oh, no, Sam, it's only happening in that one area that you talked about, right? It's not happening anywhere else. Well, I have a bad news for you. It is, in fact, happening all around you. And the problem with this is 
the Fourth Amendment gets trampled more and more and more every day. And it seems now that not only don't people know what the Fourth Amendment is, but if you tell them, they don't even care. A former Belafonte neighbor police officer has come out of the quota closet and is exposing the department's highly unethical revenue connect, uh, collection scheme. Thank God for the honest, good people like this that exist, even if he's doing it a little bit late. I wish he would have done it while he was actually on the force. It would have been more helpful. A former Belafonte neighbor's police officer has come out of the closet. I just read that. It's, I hate when they do that in articles. Ten-year veteran on the force, Officer Joe St. Clair, was ordered to carry out a policy that he says required cops to issue a certain number of traffic tickets and even traffic arrests. If the cops failed to do it, they could be fired. That, in other words, you will bust people even if they, uh, even if they are innocent. How do I know this? Because when I was telemarketing, I would sometimes have to sign up people that I knew didn't even order the damn thing. Because if I didn't, I was going to have to starve to death. That's what quotas do to you. It says, I believe the chief put an illegal mandate on his officers. I think it's unfair to the community, St. Clair told KMOV. You want to talk about feeling worthless, have to do something like that for a living. A report conducted by KMOV with the help of St. Clair exposed the downright insane requirements for Belafonte neighbor cops. According to the report, <clears throat> the mandate was put in writing. It requires officers to make a specific number of self-initiated activities each month. Even if they haven't seen anybody doing anything wrong, harass people for nothing, make sure you hit the number. St. Clair gave News 4 investigates copies of spreadsheets used by the Belafonte Neighbors Police Department to track those identities. activities. It identifies seven different activities that officers are required to do. These include writing ordinance violations, <clears throat> traffic arrests, uniform traffic tickets, parking violations, and traffic warnings, even if, you know, that simply isn't happening. If nobody did anything, you better make up that they did something to hit your quota. Welcome to America. St. Clair had to do 50 of them every month. The spreadsheet shows that traffic arrests represented up to 15% of the required activities. What if 15% of the people that you see on the road aren't doing anything wrong? Arrest them anyway. An equivalent of up to eight arrests per month and that the uniform traffic tickets were up 60% for about 30 tickets per month. To put that into perspective, 75% of all officers' duties is forced to revenue collection. Yeah, 75% of the time they're harassing people for nothing. Low-level DUIs, a 40 and a 35, that kind of BS. It says this department focuses 75% of its time on the act of revenue collection. This is particularly disturbing. It means that only 25% of the time are they trying to solve murders, prevent crimes, and investigate thefts. That's why when someone breaks into your car, nothing happens. It's probably too generous of a number as well. If you take into account the immoral war on drugs, <clears throat> solving murders, preventing crimes, and investigating thefts is probably only a tiny fraction of that 25%. Yeah, because we all know, you know, weed is just, you hit, hit a ball and your life's over. St. Clair tells KMOV that he was threatened with disciplinary action in September of 13 for failing to meet the requirement for 50 citations. The next month, he made sure to meet the minimum. What's that mean? It means that he was harassing people and giving out tickets even when he knew that they were innocent. And that's what that means. He said, I wasn't comfortable doing it, but I had to do it. I had a wife and two children that I had to support, said St. Clair, an otherwise honest man. It should be noted that St. Clair is no angel. He was named in an excessive force lawsuit six years ago that the city settled for $90,000. The victim claimed that St. Clair and another cop arrested, beat, and tased him, then dumped him into Granite City, Illinois. However... St. Clair's credibility on this matter was reinforced when Police Chief Robert Pruitt confirmed the quota system. There's your tax dollars hard at work. Pruitt admitted during an off-camera conversation with KMOV that officers have been threatened with discipline and punished for not meeting this quota. Oddly enough, just prior to admitting that officers face consequences for not meeting quotas, Pruitt claimed that it's not really a quota system. He then passed the buck and informed KMOV that Mayor Robert Doerr had ordered him not to give an interview. 
It says KMOV reporter Craig Cheatham then went to the mayor's office to have a talk with him, and according to KMOV, Belafonte neighbors Mayor Robert Dior reportedly insisted the police was le- that the policy was legal and not a quota. Yeah, it's legal to rape the Fourth Amendment. He insisted the policy was needed because officers had been lazy and weren't doing enough to protect the community. He claimed the policy was his idea. Yeah, protect the community from crimes that are not being committed. That's that the that's genius. It says it's no surprise that the mayor is behind the quota system. After all, he is likely one of the principal benefactors. In other words, he's going to get the money. The judges and prosecutors probably have their hand in the extortion cookie jar as well. In typical statist fashion, the mayor then told Cheatham that if Joe St. Clair is going to drag us through the mud, we're going to drag him through the mud too. Ugh, what a boss hog mayor. Mandating that officers issue citations and make arrests is nothing close to protecting and serving. In fact, it's quite the opposite. <clears throat> Requiring a minimum number of citations forces conflict and potentially hostile interactions. It truly forces police officers to create criminals out of otherwise innocent people in order to generate revenue, or they face losing their jobs. But hey, like Sinclair said, he's got a family to feed, so he's just doing his job when he throws you in a prison cell over a seatbelt violation. It wouldn't be nearly as disheartening if Belafonte neighbors police department with some rogue unit and that it was an isolated incident, but it's not. There are many examples. It says the most recent was November of last year, of course, the Free Thought Project in Normal, Illinois. Several cops from the Normal Police Department, one of the names, sued the cities, claiming that the department's policy forced them to make arrests without probable cause. So, you know, there you go. Three, three proofs right in a row that it's happening. Friends, this show, of which I've got three stories to get to in this show, is brought to you by Sticker Junkie. Look at these awesome Passing Time stickers. I did the logo. Sticker Junkie made these stickers. Look amazing. Our band's selling them. Uh, the correct views at Hotmail.com. They're a dollar, dollar a piece, dollar twenty-five uh, for the shipping. Friends, <clears throat> those were made by Sticker Junkie. You know, anybody that would want some stickers, maybe they got a business, maybe they have a party, maybe they're in a band. StickerJunkie.com. You design it and you will love the creations that you get. Moving on to the last three stories, this one here is brought to you by Mike McLaughlin. Look up his works, M-I-K-E-M-A-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. One of the best fictional writers and political ranters extant today, Mike McLaughlin. Find him on Facebook. Tell him you heard about it from the correct views. Mike Barrett, victory, Hershey to remove GMO ingredients from milk chocolate. This is a huge victory. The only reason I'm not incredibly excited is because you should not eat Hershey's candy. Why do I say that? Why do I try to eat as little as possible? (coughs) Look up the work of Helen Caldecott, if you doubt this. The Three Mile Island accident was greatly downplayed. And the radionuclides that went out in the 70s are still poisoning that entire area. You do not, under any circumstances, want to eat Hershey's candy or Hershey's anything. And again, she says, how can I prove this? The fact that I've been saying this for years and Hershey's never once sued me. Hershey's candy is a, uh, a fast track to cancer and uh, radioactive uh, slow motion poisoning here. However, having said that, this is remarkable news, and it's, it's news that shows that we are, in fact, being heard when we are standing out against GMOs. Uh, yeah. Again, I, I didn't eat for like two days. I waited for Christelle to make something to eat, and I damn near starved to death because it never happened. And I ate Taco Bell, three burritos, like in one bite. I was starving to death. 48 hours, people, I was starved. My problem with GMOs is that I like fast food. And I know that these bastards have poisoned it in such a way. You can give me a chicken sandwich without adding cancer-causing agents to it. Don't tell me you can't. Well, we're being heard, and things like this are happening. Uh, Joining the lineup of companies that are kneeling into public pressure, candy maker Hershey has recently announced, and there's links all over this, that it will soon remove genetically modified ingredients from its milk, chocolate, and kisses by the end of this year. What's more, the company is pledging to shift to simple ingredients, which will be exemplified by the removal of the emulsifier PGPR and artificial vanillin. Vanillin is an absolute 
high-speed roadway to cancer. Seeing vanillin out of this is remarkable news. Not vanilla, vanillin. They're different. What sparked these ingredients changes have customers been asking Hershey to move to simpler ingredients or labels? As a customer-centric company, Hershey's website says, we understand that people wants to know what is in their food. That's why we will share information openly, candidly, and transparently. I wish you would do a nuke test. How about that? Uh, it says, the changes that Hershey is making to ingredients, non-genetically modified sugar, sustainable traceable palm oil, and RBST-free milk, what is the end game? <clears throat> what a stupid question. Our iconic brands are about delivering goodness and uh, how they taste. We are moving our product portfolio to simpler ingredients. Basically, GMO food is being out. It says, in the shift to come, they announced that it will be moving to natural vanilla, non-genetically modified sugar, and milk from cows which have not been treated with the growth hormones. It's good news. Very good news. It says... Uh, they're going to roll out products that do not contain high fructose, corn syrup, or artificial colors and flavors. So except for the nuke poisoning, it's really good news. Um, Measurable.com. I thought this was also worth covering. I've got, uh, how many of you like the science stuff? If not, don't worry, i got the dumdy next. <clears throat> You're going to want to hear the dumdy of the day today. Um, i got more science news than I can get to. I do news from the science front. 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Mediaspeaks.com every Saturday. Well, I've been swarmed and I have to get to one of them on this show because I just got too many to cover on Saturdays right now. Strange lights on dwarf planet Ceres has scientists perplexed. Uh, yeah, if there's a, if there's a bright light and they go to the site here at Mashable.com and you will see that there is on a, uh, on a rock flying through space, I think that would be of interest. A dwarf planet is shining two bright lights at a NASA spacecraft right now, and our smartest scientists are unsure what they are. As bizarre as the sentence sounds, that's the situation with Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, the largest object in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Officially designated as a dwarf planet, same category as Pluto, and Pluto does not belong there, but I digress. NASA's Dawn spacecraft is approaching Cirrus ahead of the March 6th rendezvous. This is a, a, a bit a while back. The picture above was taken on February 19th at a distance of just under 29,000 miles and shows two very shiny areas of the same basin on Cirrus' surface. <coughs> I didn't want to get rid of this story because now that they've been there, you notice there's absolutely no reporting on this whatsoever. They didn't even bother to debunk it. Doesn't that strike you as alarming? Previous, if they did, I haven't seen it. Previous dawn images uh, from further away showed a single light on Cirrus, which was just as mysterious. Then, to the amazement of every astronomy geek, the one light turned out to be two, reflecting roughly 40% of all the light that was hitting them. This is truly unexpected, I would say so, and a still a mystery to us, said Andreas Nathul's lead investigator for the framing camera team at the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in Wutingen, Germany, in a NASA statement. The brightest spot of the two continues to be too small to resolve with our camera, but despite its size, it's brighter than anything else on Ceres. It's amazing how you don't read anything else about it now. So what could the bright spots be other than alien castaways signaling us with flashlights? The most obvious contender is ice, although ice would reflect more than 40% of all the light hitting it. The difference may be accounted by the resolution limit of Dawn's camera at the distance. Scientists have previously detected water vapor coming from the surface of the dwarf planet, making ice a more likely option. Scientists also have suggested the bright areas could be patches of salt. On the other hand, the location of the bright spots so close together would be an indication that they have a geologic origin, like a volcanic process, or even ice volcanoes. According to Chris Russell, principal investigator for the Dawn mission, the posi positioning of the bright spots within the same area may indicate a volcano-like origin in the spots, but scientists will have to wait for higher resolution pictures. Interesting, friends. Interesting. If any of you know what has become of these lights and these light spots, I sure would like to know, because it's interesting to me, I would say, that not only did they find that and this got such little coverage, but the fact that uh, it said it was going to be there on March 6th, we should... Uh, you think it would be front page news? What with the mysterious lights? In other words, like crickets. Nobody gave a damn. And friends, <clears throat> that brings us to the dumb D, dumb D, dumb D of the day. Dailycaller.com. 
Oh my god. Planned Parenthood has outdone themselves. I hate when pages refresh. Planned Parenthood probably should have reconsidered this anti-Rand Paul tweet. <laughs> I would say so. This is one of the dumbest things I've ever read, and that's why it's getting the dumb of the day. Pretty much the argument is that Rand Paul is anti-woman, and you shouldn't vote for him. He's uh, He hates women. It doesn't make any sense at all. The facts, however, are even more more hilarious. The official Twitter account for the nation's largest abortion provider. And again, I'm not always hating on Planned Parenthood because people go there for things other than abortions. But they have a very fascist background to them. Anyway. Switched, they switched to full attack mode after Republican Senator Rand Paul announced his presidential campaign, but one tweet earned widespread mockery for its unfortunate implications. It says that Planned Parenthood attempted to hit Rand Paul for his Show Your Support page, which allows users to identify the number of different groups, Lawyer for Rand, African American for Rand, Democrat for Rand, etc., but not as a woman for Rand. There are no women for Rand. It might have a valid point if it wasn't for the awkward phrasing. Listen what these dumbasses wrote here, and you'll see exactly uh, why it's getting the dumb of the day. What they wrote was, many Twitter users pointed out that by saying the page didn't have anything for women, <clears throat> they were implying that women couldn't be lawyers for Rand, nurses for Rand, doctors for Rand, or veterans for Rand. In other words, Planned Parenthood have just said that there are no women lawyers, nurses, doctors, or veterans. <laughs> so if you were a woman and you fought for your country, it meant nothing. You weren't really a woman, according to Planned Parenthood. And see, that's what it is. All of this feminism, third-wave feminism crap, it's just another way to divide, and it's another way to do everything they can to put Hillary Clinton into office, which has nothing to do with her being female and everything to do with 